Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections at this time, you may disconnect. And now I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Ed Kraft. Dr. Kraft, you may begin, sir. Thank you, Rico. I just wanted to mention, if anyone is having trouble connecting to the net portion of the webinar, the meeting number, the correct meeting number is P as in Paul, W as in Water, 1747065. All other uh, passwords are the, and uh, numbers are the same. So as the methamphetamine lead for SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and the Government Project Officer for SAMHSA's National Meth Summit, it is my pleasure to welcome you to SAMHSA's webinar series, Methamphetamine, a webinar series dedicated to promoting public health, partnerships, and safety for critically affected populations. Today's topic, LGBT populations and meth, updates for addressing challenges and maximizing opportunities, will include updates on research, treatment, and efforts on state and territory levels to address challenges and identify opportunities for work with LGBT populations around methamphetamine and substance abuse. We know from existing research that LGBT populations are at advanced risk for substance abuse, suicide, and other self-destructive behaviors, which are frequently caused by stigma, shame, lack of self or family acceptance, domestic violence, and many other forms of verbal and physical assault. But there is hope. LGBT-relevant treatment does work, and many former substance abusers are leading happy and productive lives today. Our speakers today will be addressing these multiple challenges and opportunities and more. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few details that might be helpful. We will be holding all questions till the question and answer session at the end of the webinar at which time the operator will review how to use your touchstone phone to participate. If you need technical assistance at any time during the call, please press zero to speak to the operator. Starting us off today is our first speaker, Dr. Brian Cochran. Dr. Cochran completed his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Washington in Seattle and his pre-doctoral inter internship with the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. His current work examines the health correlates of living with a stigmatized identity. Specifically, his interest is in substance misuse among lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Dr. Cochran. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Kraft. Um, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for logging in and calling into the webinar series. Um, it's a privilege to be presenting on this panel with three of my colleagues. My focus is going to be talking about research challenges and opportunities and working with LGBT individuals. So I'd like to highlight some of the challenges that we face as researchers who are interested in the issues of LGBT substance use, as well as towards the end of my presentation, bring in some of the opportunities that are being created with current research and by current um, scholars in the field. First slide, please. I don't think that I need to do any convincing for people on this call that substance misuse is a major public health issue, but I will do so by um, highlighting a few statistics from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is collected, of course, by SAMHSA. According to the 2008 um, NSDUH data, about 8% of the U.S. population are past month illicit drug users. That's mostly comprised by um, those who've used marijuana, misused prescription drugs, or cocaine. And also, about a quarter, 23.3% of the population participated in binge drinking over the past year. In terms of substance use among LGBT individuals, the estimates of misuse problems, and that would be abuse or dependence, are between 20 and 30%. Of course, important to know that there's considerable sampling difficulties in terms of getting a representative sample of LGBT individuals, and of course, a lot of barriers with regard to data collection, which I'm going to highlight throughout this presentation. Next, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the LGBT acronym and breaking down the acronym into its component parts. Next slide, please. This 
diagram below um, represents three different aspects of sexual orientation. So, of course, the first three components of the acronym LGBT would be referring to sexual orientation of lesbian, gay, and bisexual. Um, oftentimes, re researchers conflate dimensions of sexual orientation, but it's really important to think of these as different dimensions that may or may not correlate with one another. So, for example, you can look at sexual orientation as being defined by attraction, behavior, and identity. Um, if this Venn diagram were to be representative in terms of the sizes of these different circles, relatively more people indicate same-sex attraction than indicate same-sex behavior or than indicate same-sex identity. But regardless of the actual proportions of these three circles, they do represent different individuals, and the way that we sample in terms of our research methodologies can result in very different findings with regard to sexual orientation. Next slide, please. In addition to the LGB part of the acronym, of course, the transgender um, portion refers to gender identity. So it's important to note that there's quite a heterogeneous variety of ways in which people identify their gender. Some of the terms related to this would include transgender, transsexual, male to female, female to male, trans men, trans women, or gender queer. There's a variety of different reasons that people might identify as being transgender. Um, and it's important to keep in mind the diversity of folks who identify underneath this particular unifying term of transgender. It's also important to emphasize that gender is somewhat independent of sexual orientation. So someone may have a trans identity and may identify as heterosexual, bisexual, or homosexual, and that could be a completely independent dimension. We also have some data to indicate that people who identify as transgender are at greater risk than those who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual specifically. And it's thought that maybe there are two specific reasons that this might be the case. Um, simply put, transgender individuals comprise most likely a smaller percentage of the population than lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals do together. So perhaps there's less community support and also the risk of losing support of one's friends once one identifies as transgender that might be related to greater risk. Also, there's some data to indicate that people who identify as transgender may be more likely to be targeted in hate crimes. Next slide, please. Now, after talking about the different groups that comprise the LGBT acronym, I um, want to highlight the challenges of explaining this elevated risk. So as Dr. Kraft indicated, we do know that people who identify as LGBT do seem to be at greater risk for mental health difficulties and for substance use problems in comparison to their heterosexual or non-transgender counterparts. Um, I'm going to highlight three different possible ways of explaining that elevated risk and talk briefly about each of those. The first one is Elon Meyer's minority stress hypothesis, and this is a really a socio-cultural model of understanding mental health. The basis of this particular hypothesis is that people who are minorities in society, on the basis in this case, of course, of sexual orientation or gender identity, are going to be at elevated risk for mental health problems because they're going to be coping with the stress of discrimination that exists in society. Some of that coping may involve maladaptive behaviors such as elevated substance use. A second and somewhat competing way of explaining this elevated risk is the concept of internalized homophobia. Ariel Shidlow is one of the major writers in this particular area. And this belief is that the homophobia or transphobia that is prevalent and predominant in society is actually translated into shame for the LGBT person once internalized. And the idea is that amelioration of the shame or the internalized homophobia may occur through those same maladaptives such as substance misuse. Finally, there are environmental theories that try to explain this elevated risk, looking at places where LGBT individuals are able to congregate with one another, where often substance use tends to be the norm. The next challenge, next slide please, is related to the fact that LGBT research is currently not considered mainstream in many different ways. So first of all, there's very few LGBT-specific journals. Um, and in addition to those, when we've looked at general journals that report findings related to substance abuse and dependence, it seems that data, and sexual, data on sexual orientation and gender identity are rarely reported. This is a brief study that I'm citing here where we looked at 200 different empirical articles through the PsycInfo database that had the keywords of substance abuse that were published in 2007. 
Notably, only six of those articles actually reported the sexual orientation of their participants, and none of those articles in none of the data analyses did they say that there were gender identities other than male or female. So obviously, it seems like in the mainstream literature journals that we have, sexual orientation and gender identity, although we understand they're important variables, are rarely collected. Next slide, please. The third challenge that I'd like to highlight is the difficulties of retaining diversity while trying to conduct appropriate studies. So um, it's important as we're studying LGBT individuals that we understand that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals comprise a heterogeneous group, and different challenges may, may exist in society for each of these different groups. It's important to note that elevated risk may exist among bisexual individuals in particular, um, and particularly women. There's a number of studies that have indicated elevated risk of mental health and substance use problems among people who identify as bisexual, as well as among people who identify as transgender. Also, although we typically see studies that look at LGBT individuals kind of as an umbrella term, um, it's important to note that when, when we do look at these individual groups separately, such as gay men, lesbians, bisexual men and women, and transgender individuals, we usually deal with issues of relatively small sample size once we've broken down that acronym, thus resulting in difficulties in terms of being able to generalize to a broader population. Next slide, please. We also know that the data regarding LGBT identity are rarely collected. Um, sexual orientation is often not seen as an important demographic variable. It would be really nice if surveys such as the National Survey on Drug Use and Health did collect and report their results on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, but simply put, this is often not the case. When we look at surveys, population-based surveys that survey the population um, asking about substance use and other mental health variables, these surveys rarely offer gender options besides male and female, thus further marginalizing people who identify as transgender. There's also some concerns among researchers that including or querying about sexual orientation and gender identity might be upsetting to some participants, that asking people about sexual behavior or about sexual attraction um, may be somewhat off-putting. However, data do indicate that this usually is not the case. People tend to be fairly comfortable with being asked about these different aspects of themselves, especially in a context of the survey where they're also being asked about other potentially stigmatizing behaviors. Next slide, please. The data regarding sexual orientation and gender identity are rarely collected at the state level. This map represents um, phone calls that we place to each of the different um, state agencies that collect data on their clients who are going in for substance abuse treatment. So typically, each one of the 50 states maintains a database um, regarding the characteristics of participants who are going through their substance abuse treatment programs. When we call each of the different states to ask, First of all, whether or not they ask about sexual orientation, and second of all, to ask whether or not they have, allow for other options besides male and female with regard to gender identity, very few of the states indicated that they actually queried about these variables. So the light blue states indicates that sexual orientation and gender identity were not queried by those particular states. The slightly darker blue indicates that um, gender identity responses were given in a possible range such that they weren't binary. So it looks like about six states do allow participants to indicate if they have a gender identity other than male or female. And at the time that we collected these data, Washington State was the only state that both asked about sexual orientation and gave options for gender identity other than male or female. Next slide, please. One of the other challenges is that the data is that the data that are collected may be misleading in one way or another. I'm going to briefly describe a study that came out of my lab um, based on SAMHSA's survey of treatment services that are offered at clinics in the U.S. So every year, um, SAMHSA conducts this study called the NSSATS, um, and what that does is it queries different agencies regarding the services that they provide, um, and it asks about the types of individuals who are typically treated at their substance use programs. In the year that we did this survey, um, and sorry, in the year that we collected data based on this particular survey, approximately 8,000 agencies were reporting their services and the services that are used by their clients to SAMHSA. 
One of the options in this particular NSAT survey is that agencies can say that they have specialized groups or programs for lesbian and gay individuals. Um, and in the year that we conducted this particular survey, about 11.8% of the total, or 911 programs, indicated that they did provide such services. So they had specialized programs or groups for lesbian and gay individuals. It's important to note that these data go into a database that is searchable by clients who are looking for a specific service. In other words, if an agency indicates that they have specialized groups or programs for gay and lesbian individuals, that information then becomes publicly available to a client who may want that specific service. What we decided to do in our survey was to call these different 911 programs and essentially as fake clients asked them about what the actual services were that they provided for gay or lesbian individuals. The next slide indicates the results that we found from this. Of these 911 agencies, 71% of them, the largest part of this pie wedge, indicated that they actually did not provide any services that were available for lesbian or gay individuals. So despite indicating that they had those services, when we actually called them, they said that those were not available. A substantial proportion, about 22%, were not able to give us a response. Um, and then a few different agencies did have some sort of service that was specific to LGBT individuals. 8% um, of those agencies reported that their specialized service was that they do not discriminate against LGBT individuals. Um, while it's very debatable as to whether or not that could be considered a specific service, that is what they reported in terms of the specialized groups or programs they provided. About 6% did have a specific service for LGBT individuals. This would be a specialized group or a counselor who is trained in LGBT issues. 3% of agencies indicated that they were accepting of LGBT individuals and that that was the specialized group or program they had for gay or lesbian individuals. And then about 2% of programs said that they had services in the past, but they currently did not offer such services. Next slide, please. Briefly put, the scientific, the data that we collect as researchers, does have political implications. Um, here on this slide, I just briefly highlight that the findings that um, we have regarding LGBT individuals and substance misuse, which typically indicate elevated risk for people who identify as LGBT, can very well be misused by other individuals to, to perpetuate stereotypes. Um, for example, a study that came out of my research lab that looked at elevated severity of substance use um, among people who identified as LGBT in treatment um, in comparison to their heterosexual counterparts was actually reinterpreted by NARTH, which is a group that stands for the National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, to indicate, and I quote, this study adds weight to the many other discussions citing greater pathologies within the LGBT population. As is obvious from this particular quote, it's important to think about exactly how these findings are interpreted, which goes back to these different models that we have of explaining elevated risk among LGBT individuals. The next slide highlights some of the opportunities that do currently exist with regard to this research. Um, one of the researchers in this area, or the research groups led by Sean McCabe, um, is cited here as one of the recent studies that indicates looking at different dimensions of sexual orientation, as I identified in the beginning of my presentation, identity, attraction, and behavior separately in terms of their ability to predict substance misuse. This is really important because, since I mentioned before, these dimensions don't always correlate with one another, and we probably have different indicators of risk, whether we ask about identity, attraction, or behavior. Next, research examining these explanatory models, such as the internalized homophobia hypothesis or the minority stress model, is currently underway. So being able to look at the mechanisms that really explain this elevated risk is, a, is an important component of LGBT-focused research. Also, the increasing awareness of LGBT identities is really creating more opportunities for research. Um, the dialogue about gay and lesbian issues, about bisexual issues and transgender issues is becoming much more frequent in the media and in today's society. And as a result, this is creating many more opportunities for researchers to look at the importance of these variables in understanding substance use. Also, national initiatives for better data collection are underway. The results of this National Methamphetamine Summit, in which many of you may have participated, um, have resulted in state action teamwork. Many state action teams are working to 
change to the situation where their states are going to start to collect data on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity and to recognize the importance of these variables in treatment and educating providers about how to work confidently with LGBT individuals. And then finally, of course, the field is still quite young. This is a new area of research, um, and we hope to see many more new investigations that help to answer the key questions related to these issues in the future. My final slide, I'd like to acknowledge my research team. Um, I have a list of my graduate students, um, my undergraduate students who I've worked with are perhaps too numerous to list. Um, and I'd like to also thank the University of Montana departments in which I exist. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing the next presentations. Once again, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Cochran. Uh, once again, I would like to note anyone who's having trouble joining the web portion of the webinar that the meet, correct meeting number is P as in Paul, W as in water, 1747065. So again, thank you, Dr. Cochran. And joining us now is our next speaker, Dr. Patricia Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, a clinical psychologist, is a nationally experienced and recognized expert with more than a quarter century of experience in HIV AIDS, LGBT health, disability issues, and mental health and substance abuse treatment and program development. She is currently the clinical director of the DC Community AIDS Network, or DC CAN, a nonprofit AIDS service organization targeting the LGBT and people of color communities in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, are you ready? We're ready for you to begin your presentation. Yes, thank you, Ed. I'm sorry. I lost my video feed. I was trying to fix it, but I can't. But I will go with my slides in order. Uh, the first one being historical psychocultural factors, common in LGBT identity uh, formation. Is that one up? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, the first issue, again, is heterosexual discrimination and stigma. And you've heard some of these issues by Brian. Um, the impact of, of these has, has not been effectively measured, except in terms of overt symptomatology, historically. We really don't have an idea of the more subtle and softer signs of years of of either experiencing discrimination or reading about discrimination, and the same thing with, with stigma. Uh, we do know from much of the experiences of LGBT people and from the literature about the extensive ridicule and verbal abuse and violence uh, that many LGBT people suffer, particularly uh, in their elementary and uh, in high school years. Uh, and this, again, is often related to the gender, uh, how different they are gender presentation-wise uh, from the rest of their, of their classmates. And then you have, of course, the uniform almost disapproval and the rejection by family, church, society, and friends, uh, so that people are, uh, have no one they feel often that they can trust with their emerging identity. And the ultimate uh, impact of this is people internalize uh, all of these, these messages uh, into internalized homophobia with the attendance guilt and shame, which can, can cloud all of their um, their adolescent years for those who are coming out early. And for those who come out later, they are often questioning during the same years. And this, in turn, leads to increased stress. The minority stress that Brian talked about, increased levels of depression, increased levels of anxiety, and increased levels of substance abuse. And the final thing that is different for the LGBT community is we, we have few, if any, role models accessible to us. Uh, in growing up. Um, most other minority cultures, and there are many that have suffered um, all of the same kinds of, of, not exactly the same, but extensive discrimination and stigma and violence and hate, but they have usually done so from the confines of their own families and their own identified group. So that they learn at an early age uh, how to accept themselves in a positive way, as they accept their parents in a positive way, and how to cope uh, in a better way with those incidents. Uh, LGBT or youth have none of that. Now, some of the, so this is the second slide, please. The common historical coping, coping mechanisms uh, which have been developed by LGBT individuals. Uh, the first one, of course, is simply denial, uh, living on the down low, living in the closet, 
uh, having uh, some people totally denying their whole life, their LGBT identity, and some segmenting their lives so that they are able to participate in sex uh, but deny themselves the emotional intimacy altogether for fear of being discovered. Uh, so these would be um, certainly, in, I think, I think there's less now than it was before, but the folks who um, are married, uh, even though they have no interest in getting married, but feel that is the only way they can live out a satisfactory life. Then on the positive side, uh, we have folks uh, who are out with their chosen families, uh, their gay and LGBT families, who are also uh, share their orientation, and who may develop a common social and familial structure which is very close to the traditional nuclear family structure. And in some parts of the community, in the transgender community in particular, uh, people will be assigned specific relative names. So there will be aunts, aunts within the community, uh, mothers within the community, and again, to try to duplicate the nuclear family uh, system. And for others in the LGBT community, it will be becoming involved in LGBT-specific organizations where there is a sense of, of total acceptance and total understanding and also a positive as opposed to stigmatized identity. And then one of the, the interesting images that has emerged in both my clinical work and in reading some of the literature is this, uh, the, the out with the positive romanticized outlaw image, uh, the attractiveness of the outlaw image, uh, the person who's willing to go against the grain, who is not conformist, uh, who is more, can be more outrageous, uh, can be more uh, daring, uh, and there's a very powerful pull to that image. It's kind of a, a reaction formation to the negative image and turning on its head and making being an outlaw and a cast off a very positive thing of people bonding together within that, within that range. And the same type of, of identification will be out with sex positive. So that being identified for much of their lives is only through their sexual behavior. It's identifying with that in a positive way and being very concerned about maintaining a sex positive identity. Uh, and this has created various problems when we are trying to do safer sex trafficking. Uh, there's one point, uh, some people have been called the sex police uh, because it was almost if you were to do safer sex, you were um, denying the sex positive identity, particularly in the gay male culture. And then the out in the bar culture, um, which was a, certainly remains a big uh, place where people uh, socialize and get their identity reinforced. Uh, maybe less so than it was in the, the 60s and 70s, but it's still very much a part of both lesbian and gay male culture. Uh, this, of course, leads to, by definition, uh, self-medicating for all the stress and anxiety and depression uh, with both sex and substance abuse. Uh, and that, I think, culminates in the whole club drug and crystal meth issues in the uh, male community and in the women's community, um, more with the uh, increased alcohol and tobacco problems. And I think this gets back to the issue of role models again, because those are kind of the role models, the bar culture models, which have been portrayed for many people as who you are uh, if you are LGBT. And I'll speak a little bit about the different stigmas, and I think this is one of the big barriers you have. We, again, think of the outlaw positive image of drawing people in, and then the negative image, the negative thing that would be a barrier to care uh, would be stigma. Now, historically, uh, straight women, the stigma of alcoholism has been related to them being identified as loose women. So a lot of straight women have been reluctant uh, to acknowledge their alcoholism or to get into treatment because of the social construct of uh, women who are alcoholics are also sleeping around, basically. Uh, with bisexual with lesbians and bisexual women, it is a very different stigma. Uh, the, the positive stigma for lesbians, and I'll speak to lesbians here, is that the hard drinking woman who can hold her liquor is a strong woman who can take care of herself. Uh, that the woman who is not able to hold her liquor and is not able to handle her drinking is weak and dependent. Uh, and it's very important to think about how the strength and independence has been an issue down to history in the lesbian community. Um, when I came out in the 60s and 70s on the East Coast, there were six role definitions for lesbians, um, beginning with a lipstick lesbian, who was a woman who wore makeup, uh, who was usually middle class, uh, who could dress uh, more femininely or more preppy uh, as she chose, uh, but she was a lipstick lesbian. A femme, which was someone who could wear makeup but usually didn't and was, was, would never dress particularly uh, femininely. A sissy butch was a woman who identified as butch 
but was very feminine in her in her features and in her manner, uh, and was um, and identified as a butch. The butch again would do no makeup ever, uh, traditional butch, no makeup ever, and would be identified as a stronger of, of a pair of partners, the one to make the traditional male decisions, the one to hold the door, if you will. Then there was the dyke. Uh, and the dyke was a, a more male identified. I think now we would see that many of those folks were trans men, uh, would never wear a feminine clothes, would always wear men's clothes, uh, would have you know, cigarettes popped up in their shirt sleeves, uh, and would be considered, and was, it was more often a working class image. And then finally, the stone butch. And the stone butch was a woman who was butch, but would never let a woman touch her in any way. So totally the active partner. Now these definitions and roles were very fluid. Um, there was a saying at that point of, of butch in the street, stem in the sheets, because people could move back and forth among these roles all the time, depending on the relationship. So that many butchers would turn turtle, which was called, for another butch and become the more feminine partner uh, in a second coupling. But at the core of all of these identities was not a male identification, which was often misinterpreted at. Was at the core of it with strong, independent women, a survival persona. Every single one of these folks, whether Sam or Bush, uh, valued and saw themselves as strong and independent. So therefore, the giving up drinking, giving into, into treatment, uh, getting a 12-step program, acknowledging, quote unquote, weakness and their lack of control was extremely frightening. And you have to remember that I think many of these women uh, developed these identifications in response to previous abuse, uh, both physical and sexual, that had occurred in their lives in previous sense of, of helplessness and not having an acceptable identity. So once they found one, it's very difficult to give up their sense of strength and that they were people that could, could take care of themselves, uh, which speaks to these women need very clearly lesbian-specific treatment. Now I'd like to speak to the third slide, the impact of HIV AIDS on the LGBT community. Uh, it basically in terms of the intersection of three separate mental health uh, disordered systems. Uh, number one, there's no question that HIV AIDS has, has been the major issue in the LGBT community for more than a quarter of a century. Uh, it has impacted on us in every aspect of community life and culture. But on the personal level, what we have seen is increase in mental health systems uh, of unknown affected uh, by HIV, depression, anxiety, um, years of personal pain and grief, multiple losses uh, for, for those of us who came of age when the AIDS epidemic was, was killing people, you see speaking of losses in the hundreds, and whole cohorts of gay men wiped out, and whole cohorts of lesbian gay affiliations that were there uh, wiped out uh, over the course of the last 20 years. Um, and we know something about substance mental health issues, that mental health systems, ordinary symptoms, actually occur before, earlier in life, uh, before the onset of substance abuse, and we think the reason that is that substance abuse uh, occurs as a reaction to those mental health partly the symptoms as a way of treating them. So we've seen an increase in mental health symptoms and an increase in substance abuse as the epidemic has raged in the community. There's also been an increase in symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder occurs when, whenever there's an overwhelming trauma occurs uh, for which person has no coping strategies in place. And what results in that is depression and panic, uh, intense feelings of anxiety, re-experiencing of the trauma, so that people who have lost partners, friends, and lovers will go over and over the, the death day of that person sitting by the bed. They will go over and over at Thanksgiving how many people they have lost and are no longer here to be with them. And it just is a, is a cycle that keeps, that keeps reinforcing itself. And some, and for those who are caregivers of, of these folks, they get a, a double whammy, both the personal and in the community, uh, community burnout. And what happens, symptoms of that, caregiver community burnout, very big changes in self-efficacy. So someone who is very confident in themselves and able to, thought they could do anything, becomes very uh, failure-oriented and feels no matter what they do, it's not going to make any difference. This, of course, is going to impact on their ability to solve through one prevention methods and to get into treatment. Uh, secondly, there's an overcommitment that was previously there to work and to volunteer and to do everything you could to change the epidemic, changes to avoidance, uh, avoidance of the subject. And we see that throughout the community. 
Oh, we don't see the posters, we don't see the ads, we see drop off in volunteers and contributions, uh, a lot less visibility to the AIDS epidemic, a sense that there are no, no new solutions and that until there's a cure, there's nothing anyone can do. Very different psychological mindset than we had in the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, finally, strong uh, idealism and optimism change the cynicism and negativity. So any new solution or any new suggestion or any new project is met with doesn't make any sense. There's no point in trying anything. We know it's all going to fail and everybody is going to get sick. And, and a sense of fatalism. Um, you know, now looking at D.C., it's probably 50% of our MSMs are already infected, uh, which is extremely high. We've only got to a third during the height of the epidemic and now it's at 50% and increasing the fastest growing group in the city. Uh, indifference to minor details changes to constant complaints. So people who would work out of a warehouse or like, distribute needles out of the back of the car are now much more concerned about how their space looks, how many hours they have to work, when they're going to get off, a whole change in the way uh, the age, uh, and community and LGBT community structures in general are working. And finally, energy and commitment change to despair and anger. And when people can't meet their own expectations for something that's extremely important to them, then they get angry. And I think we see that uh, happening as well. And then we're also seeing increases in violence to us and increases in public uh, criticism of our communities and marriage that is put forward, which increases that anger and frustration. So then again, on slide four, uh, current uh, LGBT community crisis. A crisis, by definition, is a situation where you're confronting something very serious, and in this case, HIV is life and death situation. It's extremely dangerous to you, it's perceived as dangerous, and your old solutions don't work. And that's what leads to a sense of panic. The thing that people fear the most of all emotions is ego exhaustion, being immobile, totally locked in place in the face of, of a highly dangerous and scary situation. And the two common crisis responses to that are fight or flight. And fight activities include acting out, which would include impulsive kinds of behaviors, but anything that allows a person a sense of being in control, even if they're not. And flight activities, which are escape, escape into sex, into self-medication, uh, into denial that there's anything going on, there's no problem. And when you combine these fight and flight activities, you can get some very powerful uh, behaviors that are very difficult to change. One is suicide, where the client simultaneously takes themselves out of the painful situation and also addresses their need to do something and directs their anger outward to the people who will find them and be blamed for the suicide. But even more, I think, attractive, given our history and culture, is sex and drugs. And when you combine sex and drugs, which you can do with crystal meth and the other club drugs, there's an extremely powerful attraction to this. Uh, since it is, in fact, responding to this general community crisis with something that is positive and active, feels good, uh, and of course results in more sex and more drugs, and restores the image, the outlaw image, and the sense of power and control. Now, when things fail, when these, these situations fail, and fight and fight are not really positive coping strategies in the sense of changing the situation, the epidemic continues to spread, which it is doing everywhere. Uh, traditional coping methods continue to fail, prevention is not working. Mental health disorders continue to increase, and we've seen elevated levels in all of our surveys of depression and anxiety and substance abuse. Burnout symptoms continue to increase. A loss, no energy, a sense of fatalism, can't face another, another, another epidemic, a uh, loss of, of support systems. Individual fight and flight responses continue to, to increase. Uh, you're, again, avoiding issues by acting up and not solving them. And then the damaging combined fight and flight responses uh, continue to, to by continue to increase, namely suicide and substance abuse related to uh, sex and drugs. So how do we address this? First, we have to recognize the real difficulties of being out are still there. Those of us who've been around a long time think things have changed so much, and, and we're getting married in the district uh, this week, we hope people are, um, that we don't realize that for most people, they are still struggling with the same issues that we struggled with as young, as young people. And on the flip side of that, the positive legal steps that have ta been taken are also diminishing our outlaw role giving less of a, uh, of a stability to that role. If we become just like everybody else, then where is the support uh, that we can use that the outlaw role previously gave us? Limited LGBT treatment resources, and I'll say this specifically also for women. So many women's programs have been designed by and for men, including the 12-step programs. 
and there are certainly very few programs that are specifically addressing the lesbian and bisexual women issues, and, and they do differ. Uh, we need to improve the visibility of LGBT substance abuse treatment aids, which gets back to the need for universal data collection. And we need, very importantly, to screen all LGBT substance abuse for co-occurring disorders, which include PTSD. And we recommend here in the district using the client diagnostic questionnaire developed first in New York to do that. We need to have a good handle on how bad the PTSD is so we can deal with the depression and the anxiety and the substance abuse. Be alert for signs of burnout in yourselves and your staff and your community. So the earlier we get help with burnout, the sooner it can resolve. If you wait too long, you lose that person, and long before you lose them, they've lost their ability to help other people. And finally, develop positive and effective coping and crisis resolution strategies, focusing on this as a crisis for the community and for the individual, and developing strong group support to help people get through it and to the other side, and then to maximize recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. I'd now like to introduce Joanne Keatley. Joanne is the director of the U.S. at the University of California, San Francisco Center of Excellence for, for Transgender Health. Joanne received her Master of Social Welfare degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Born in Mexico City, she is proud to be a Latina transgender woman and is bilingual in English and Spanish. Joanne has consulted on transgender health with the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Health, the health Resources and Services Administration, and SAMHSA. Ms. Keatley. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. And um, I just want to say it's a pleasure to join my esteemed colleagues on this webinar. Um, and I'll start off with uh, this next slide. So I just wanted to share with you a working definition of transgender, and I do appreciate Brian's overview about um, the different ways in which transgender people identify, but for the purposes of my uh, talk, I'll just say that um, I use the word trans or the um, abbreviation trans um, as a means of shorthand for transgender and transsexual, and really a working definition of transgender would be a person whose sex gender identity or gender expression differs from the sex that was assigned to them at birth. Um, one of the things that I always caution people about is that it is hard to guess who is trans, and so particularly I think if you're in a service setting and um, you are meeting with a person for the first time, it's important not to make assumptions about the person that you are um, assessing or triaging because you just never know. And I am sharing with you some slides, pictures of uh, trans people who go about their daily lives and may or may not be disclosing their trans identities uh, depending on the service setting. But you can see, you know, it's a quite diverse group of people that I'm speaking about. Um, I would say that it's important for service providers to think about uh, questions that you may ask or that you may include in intake forms. And I think that one of the first things that one needs to ask themselves is, is your question necessary or are you just asking it for your own curiosity and thus the question would then not be appropriate? So for an example, I say, are you going to have surgery? Now, often people feel that that is a, an appropriate question to ask of a trans person. Um, but um, that can be very difficult for a trans person to answer. For example, if someone asked me that question, I might say, well, yes, I had a tonsillectomy when I was 11 years old. But we all know that that's not really the question that you would be asking of me. So um, it's important to clarify. It's important to also know, you know, why you're asking the question. Some important guidelines to keep in mind so that you ask questions that are appropriate for your work are, you know, what do you already know? What, in addition to what you already know, what do you need to know? And then how do you do that in a sensitive way? I always encourage people to ask 
these kinds of sensitive questions in a private setting where um, the trans person will not be embarrassed by um, questions that they're not able to uh, address in a public setting. So I think a lot of service providers are challenged around the use of pronouns with trans people. Um, I give the advice, don't sweat it. Politely ask. Remember that you probably are not the first person who has been challenged by this. Um, also remember that individual trans people may have a preference of pronoun, such as he or she. They may not have a preference uh, for a pronoun, and it would be okay to use he or she. They may prefer that you use a gender neutral pronoun, such as Z, and they may prefer that you not use any pronoun at all. So again, let your client be your guide, and they will um, share with you what works for them. Now, obviously, if a person is coming into your service setting and is uh, expressing their gender in a masculine or a feminine way, you need to honor that until you have had an opportunity to triage with them individually and then determine if they are, in fact, using another uh, pronoun that may be um, incongruent with the expression of their gender when you first encounter them. I want to share with you some uh, substance use data among transgender people in the United States. So IDU has been reported in a number of studies ranging from 2 to 40 percent. Among them, you can see here, uh, 12 percent among uh, in Chicago, a study with uh, Gretchen Kanegi in Boswick in 2005, um, 13 percent in Atlanta with Bowles and Allison, 15 percent in Philadelphia with Gretchen Kanegi again, 20% uh, in Boston, 23% San Francisco with Nomoto and all. That was a study that I was involved in. And 34% um, um, among male to females and 18% among female to males in San Francisco with uh, uh, Kristen Clements, who was an epidemiologist with the San Francisco Department of Public Health. And then in Houston, 40% um, use of uh, Reserinol in 2005. Methamphetamine uh, lifetime usage, uh, you can see the ranges here from 2% to 46%, 2 percent um, in Philadelphia, 4% New York City, Morel and all with a house ball study report. 4% uh, in Chicago with um, Robert Garofalo. Now, that was an, it was interesting to note that this was among male to female transgender youth um, and not adults. 5% uh, uh, with our colleague Kathy Reback, who you'll hear from uh, in a few minutes. And then in San Diego, the uh, 2006, 5%. Uh, 16% in uh, a statewide needs assessment that uh, was conducted in Virginia with Jessica Xavier and all. And then uh, again in Houston, 28% reserve and all, 25% by injection, 30% by non-injection in San Francisco, the Rose study, and then 46% ever used and 28% in the past six months with our colleague Kathy Wiebeck in 2001. So um, the substance use um, leads to um, high ele or elevated HIV risk. And I wanted to just kind of put this in a way that uh, you could understand that trans people don't use substances just to use substances. There is a whole degree of stress in trans people's lives. 
around the stigma that's attached to being transgender, the discrimination that people experience in day-to-day -day settings, that um, the denial of employment opportunities that lead people into sex work, that then leads one to um, use substances as a form of coping and then ultimately leading to higher um, rates of mental health and self-esteem issues, which then lead to higher HIV risk. Um, and there are indications that trans ID drug users would be three times more likely to be HIV positive than non-ID use. Um, and then, of course, you know, beyond HIV, there is the additional um, STDs that people put themselves at risk for. Now, um, trans people don't wake up um, as youth and then all of a sudden just decide to become sex workers. Um, I refer to sex work for trans people um, as a form of survival sex. Um, I believe that many uh, trans people are, in fact, denied opportunities for employment, for education, and for job training as a result of societal bias against those trans people, and then as a result end up engaged in survival sex work, often as young um, as youth, and then that also leads to H elevated risk for HIV um, and um, interaction with clients and, and increased primary partners. So many trans people um, are interacting with the criminal justice system as a result of some of these societal conditions that they are um, dealing with. Um, as a result of the transphobia that people um, experience in their lives that lead to sex work and drug use that often leads them into the criminal justice system and then additional risk while they're incarcerated. Um, sadly, incarceration rates among trans women range from 37 to 65 percent in, in samples studies where the data has been collected, and in one LA study, 15% reported unprotected sex during incarceration. I wanted to share with you the HIV prevalence estimates among trans people. A recent national meta-analysis of 29 studies concluded that the average prevalence for trans women for HIV was 28% or one in four when it was last confirmed and 12% by self-report. Um, that was Jeff Herbst et al. at the CDC. And then among African-American trans women, they had the highest prevalence for 56% according to Herbst et al. And, uh, compared to other racial and ethnic groups. I just wanted to share with you my thoughts around barriers and facilitators and uh, around program implementation. I believe that adequate funding is crucial to program implementation. That's not different from, you know, any other population. Um, community involvement, however, in program facilitates successful implementation. I think that for trans people, it's so important to see people like themselves involved in the delivery of the service. Um, it really does make a huge difference when a trans person walks in the door and they can see um, elements of the program that really clearly are designed to make them feel comfortable. Um, and so whenever possible, I really encourage agencies to think about how to involve the local transgender community in your program implementation. Hiring trans staff at all levels, I think, is essential to programmatic success. And there are many trans people who are highly qualified. Now, some of them may or may not have academic preparation, but Many are very um, enthused and very eager to um, work with um, agencies that will hire 
uh, them. So please think about hiring transgender people if at all possible, and then allow them to, you know, work up the ladder so that they are given increasingly more responsibilities. And I think that um, you will find that they will lead to program success. And then also, of course, assurance of privacy. Um, I think that both for trans staff and for trans clients, um, allow them to disclose when it's appropriate or when it isn't appropriate to self-disclose their identity. I think that um, if you are going to hire trans staff, it's important not to think about just hiring one trans person because then you put them um, in a very difficult situation. They may feel um, vulnerable. Um, have, um, you know, opportunities for them to engage with other staff members and to grow from the experience. So here's some additional barriers, barriers and facilitators uh, regarding rec recruitment and retention of clients. So one of the challenges that we face is that trans people are often, oops, I think, I apologize, it jumped forward here. So, um, okay. So tri transience of clients is a challenge because often trans people are living in places like single room occupancy units or they may be living on a friend's couch or maybe they don't have um, a home at all. Um, they may not have the financial resources to have a, a a, uh, a steady uh, place to live. And so I think that that creates a challenge that one must address. Um, it's also difficult to meet all the varying needs of a diverse community. Trans women's needs are very distinct from trans men's needs. And I think that when you're designing programs, you have to keep that in, uh, in mind. Um, Past experiences of stigma and discrimination may lead clients to avoid services. Um, I can't tell you how often trans um, individuals that I've come in contact with have shared with me, you know, tremendous bias that they've experienced from service providers and often well-meaning service providers, but um, gender is such an integral part of who one is that even when the provider is well-meaning, they may actually uh, use language that is discriminatory or hurtful for the trans client. So be careful about language. And then hormone use, I can't stress this enough. Hormone use should not be considered as optional. If a trans person is on hormones, one of the greatest barriers that you can set up in a service recovery or in a substance abuse recovery system is to deny the trans person continued use of hormones. Um, that is the way that trans people affirm their sense of self and are able to um, have their bodies um, correlate with their sense of self. So don't think of hormone use as continued use of substances. Uh, there are physicians that will prescribe for, horm for hormones, and if the trans person is seeking them, then help them obtain um, adequate medical monitoring of the hormones. And that concludes my piece of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Keatley. And I just want to say one, for one final time, for anyone who's having trouble accessing the web portion of the program, the, the corrected meeting number is T as in Paul, W as in water, 17470065. Our final presenter this afternoon is Dr. Kathy Reebok. Dr. Reebok is a senior research scientist with Friends Research Institute and an associate research sociologist with the 
University of California at Los Angeles Integrated Substance Abuse Program. Dr. Rebach's research focuses on the intersection of sexual identity, gender identity, substance use, and HIV risk behavior among two marginalized and extremely vulnerable populations, gay and bisexual male substance users and male to female transgender women. Dr. Reebok has served as principal investigator or co-principal investigator of intervention, ethnographic, and epidemiological studies funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, <clears throat> CHRP, the California State Office of AIDS, and the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Dr. Reebok. Thank you, Dr. Kraft, and I also want to state that it was uh, an honor to be asked to be part of this presentation and uh, to be able to um, present with such um, esteemed colleagues. Well, I'm from Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles we have um, just under 62,000 individuals who are living with HIV and AIDS. And of those, it's estimated that approximately 13,000 have undiagnosed HIV. Um, what's important to note that is of those 13,000 undiagnosed persons with HIV, 54% of are responsible for 54% of the new infections. So it's very important. We have a real campaign going on in Los Angeles now to identify the undiagnosed HIV individuals. Um, the estimated HIV seroprevalence, this is estimated from L.A. County, is 15% 15, 15 among men who have sex with men, gay and bisexual identified, 12% among men who have sex with men and women, non-gay identified gay and bisexual men, uh, or heterosexually identified men who have sex with men, and 21% among transgender women. And again, it's these high rates of seroprevalence that warrant an investigation um, of the risk factors and substitutes among these populations. Um, I was asked to share the findings from a couple of my studies and look at both um, the first part of this webinar addressing the challenges and the second part um, uh, looking at the opportunities. And so I'm going to start with um, addressing the challenges and look at a program that I have um, that works with uh, MSM, MSMW, and transgender women who are at high and moderate risk of HIV infection um, here in the Los Angeles County, particularly Hollywood, West Hollywood, and the downtown area. These are primarily individuals who are substance users, who are sex workers, who are homeless, and have mental health um, concerns. Um, so we're really specifically funded to work with the very um, high-risk individuals. Um, the program runs from 11 in the morning to 1.30 in the morning with rotating staff. We do outreach, and individuals come to our community site, which is located right in the hub of Hollywood and West Hollywood for um, services. And the staff are all paraprofessionals who represent the target population that they serve. And I'm going to run through this quickly because I did note that we're short on time. Um, so in the, in the outreach, we go out and we give gifts um, that are needed um, supplies to those on the street. Uh, we do an encounter with the individuals where we assess their risk. And when they um, are able to come into the site or if we have time in the field, it's hard in the field because people are very busy and don't necessarily want to stop and talk about risk behaviors. But when they do, we go into a longer individual intervention, uh, which can go 20 minutes to an hour. Uh, they come into the site for group uh, interventions. They, we have skill building groups, support groups transitional uh, life skills group for the transgender women, open discussion, uh, an art group, um, and 
we collect data during the first three groups, although they're open-ended and people can stay for as long as they want. A meal is provided, a full uh, dinner is provided at each group. There are separate groups for MSM and MSMW and for the transgender uh, women. So the, the data that I'm going to discuss today from these came from two of these studies, what we call the GUIDE program and the transaction program. Uh, 500 uh, identified as MSM, uh, 271 as MSMW, and 237 as transgender women collected uh, over a two-year period, 2005-2007, looking at the substitute behaviors and the um, uh, high-risk sexual behaviors. And here are the logos for the two populations. These were designed by the program participants um, with the help of this, the skills of uh, one of our staff members who knows um, Photoshop really well. Our outreach strategies are probably very similar to those of, of, of many programs that do outreach uh, when we go into the streets. It's based on a harm reduction model. We work with clients on their own agenda. Uh, we go, we, the staff all go through a six to eight week training uh, where we focus a lot on being value clear and uh, not having our particular judgments on any behavior um, affect or interfere with the outreach process. So let's look at the um, populations for a bit. Uh, demographically, you can see that um, for the, the transgender women, we enrolled in outreach to more Hispanic Latino women. Uh, there were more Caucasian white individuals with the MSM and MSMW population and more African American black uh, individuals with the MSMW. Um, the age was pretty consistent across the three populations. When you look at educational attainment, However, uh, the transgender women had far fewer of them had a high school diploma or GED, where the MSM uh, were more likely to have uh, graduated from high school. HIV status is much higher than the estimated prevalence through LA County with our particular population, which is really a subgroup of individuals in LA County, as I said earlier. Um, 39% of the MSM were uh, HIV infected, 18% of MSMW, and 23% of the transgender women. And the um, MSM and MSMW were more likely to be homeless or live in marginal uh, situ housing situations, although 51% half of the transgenders that we, um, we, we uh, met were homeless. We found was that many of the transgenders uh, in LA, anyways, um, clustered together and would rent um, inexpensive ho hotel rooms and stay in kind of a communal situation in the downtown LA area. Uh, in terms of substance use, in 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 most studies, you find that the two frequencies. In the general population, you find that the two frequency, frequently used drugs are alcohol and marijuana in that order. But with this population, we found that marijuana was the most frequently used drug for MSMW, but that methamphetamine was the most frequent, frequently used drug for MSM. And methamphetamine followed marijuana for all three of the populations. Meth use during sex was um, high for all the uh, populations at approximately 40% for MSMW, 35% for M, um, excuse me, 40% for MSM, 35% for MSMW, and 15% for transgender women. And when we look at exchange sex, transgender women engaged in more uh, exchange sex than either of the other two populations at approximately. 49% uh, with about 21% for MSMW and 18% for MSM. And when you look at the mean number of exchange partners, again, 
it is um, much higher for transgender women at approximately 20 partners in the previous 30 days um, compared to MSMW at, at just under six and MSM at five partners. When we look at other than exchange partners, what you see on um, is that we're looking at M main, it means male main, female main, transgender main, male casual, female casual, transgender casual, and male anonymous, female anonymous, and transgender anonymous. And as you can see that um, MSM have much more male anonymous partners, transgenders have more male casual partners. I'm going to look at some uh, sexual risk behaviors now. Um, with regards to receptive anal intercourse, um, transgenders uh, have, and this is all the previous 30 days, the transgenders do have more receptive anal intercourse, 61%, followed by MSM at 40%. However, they also have uh, report uh, more condom use, and this is always used in the condom with receptive anal sex at about 71%. And I, I have similar findings for insertive anal sex with condom use. Um, MSM engage in more internal, insertive anal sex than both MSMW and transgenders, but again, it's the transgenders that are engaged in the highest um, use of condom to, with all sexual uh, partners. So um, just to make some conclusions on this study, the real take-home message here is the extreme high HIV positivity rates, which is much higher than those that are compared to the LA County estimate. Again, uh, the high rates of meth use, particularly with the MSMW and MSM, 51 and 49 percent, transgenders was 26 percent. Um, MSMW more likely to use crack cocaine, and MSM more likely to use amyl nitrates or other inhalant steering sex. And over 40% of MSM use methamphetamine during sex versus uh, MSMW and transgender. Uh, again, with transgenders, the real concern is the exchange sex. However, um, the transgenders have a great uh, more exchange sex and higher mean number of exchange partners. Uh, but what's very important to remember is that they also had a much higher frequency of always using condoms during both uh, insertive and receptive anal sex. So what uh, the implications for policy within LA County is that uh, these are very high populations. They represent the core of the HIV epidemic in Los Angeles County. Uh, with methamphetamine, uh, interventions should focus on decrease of meth use uh, as HIV prevention. With MSW, we need to be concerned about possible bridge for HIV transmission. And for transgender women, again, although there's high um, reported sex work, um, there is higher rates of condom use and lower rates of substance use. Therefore, these interventions should continue to emphasize safer sex behaviors, exchange sex, particularly around exchange sex. Um, and all interventions need to represent these distinct patterns of substance use and sex work for each population and should not be merged into one intervention. I want to quickly then move to some of the findings on the treatment intervention that we have for gay and bisexual men. And this is the second half of the webinar title, Maximizing Opportunity. Um, we have a combined contingency management and gay-specific cognitive behavioral therapy intervention. Contingency management is when we provide these increasing valuable reinforcers for clean urine, so every time someone enrolled in the study comes and delivers a urine sample, which we collect three times a week, um, their value of clean urine goes up in points, and those points can be traded in for anything that they want that is pro 
uh, social and healthy. We, we will pay their bills, we buy them computers, we um, give them gift cards, um, and that's coupled with a cognitive behavioral therapy specifically for um, gay and bisexual identified men. The study design is an eight-week intervention with a, uh, another eight weeks of continuing care. The gay-specific cognitive behavioral therapy focuses specifically on gay culture, gay identity, uh, gay sex, HIV, living in an HIV world, and recreating a gay life independent from methamphetamine use. Um, here's an example of what it means to take standard cognitive behavioral therapy and adopt it for uh, a gay and bisexual um, uh, meth users. In a standard cognitive behavioral therapy, when you look at external triggers, it might be a sporting event or a concert or movies. When you adopt it for a, a gay-specific cognitive behavioral therapy, we talk about gay pride, going to a bathhouse, Halloween, uh, relapse justification. In, in standards, someone might say, uh, I just got injured, I might as well use where we'll give the example, a friend just died of AIDS and using will make me forget for a while. The concept of living one day at a time in the standard uh, CBT could be tomorrow something could happen to ruin all this. Uh, with the gay specific, the example is um, I zero converted even though I knew about safer sex. Here's a copy of what the manual looks like and it's available free for download at the UCLA ISAP website. And as I stated earlier, this is basically um, the premise of contingency management. Um, it's interesting, it's an interesting intervention um, because it literally is an intervention that gives uh, increasingly valuable voucher points for clean urine, but what we have found is that it's potent, that it's effective. We see longer retention, we see significantly more clean urine, and we see significantly longer stretches of clean urine when we integrate contingency management into the uh, manualized intervention. So in this study, we had 171 participants. Just under 60% of them were Caucasian. Almost all of them identified as gay. 63% of them were HIV infected, which is much higher than our street-based homeless population, uh, which takes me back to uh, the premise of my work, which is that the longer one uses methamphetamine, the more likely they are to seroconvert. So by the time these guys are coming in and requesting treatment, 63% of them are already HIV infected. Uh, the age is a little higher because these, are, these people are now requesting treatment, so they've been using longer uh, at just uh, about 40 years old. And they're more highly educated. Length of time of heavy meth use is just under four years. Average time used uh, time in an average day is eight times. Days in the past 30 days was just under 12 days, 11.1 .1 days, and they spend an average of $475 a month um, on methamphetamine. And most do feel they are addicted to meth by the time they come into treatment. And uh, most of uh, 61 percent that say meth and sex always goes together, and hence the high HIV prevalence rate among this population. It's really only two that say that meth and sex never goes together, and those are the project users. 92 of them said they were um, high on meth when they had sex in the previous 30 days, and the mean number of Unprotected insert of anal intercourse was 6.39 times, and anal was 6.25 times. And we're going to get back to that in a minute. And 70% believe that their sexual behavior is considered compulsive. 87% um, report a history of an STI with a mean of 4.4 STIs in a lifetime. So we're going to get look at some of the outcome findings 
from um, the study. The guys come in and they're averaging 11.17 days of meth use in the previous um, um, 30. And then it, as soon as they come into the treatment, we see immediate decrease. And that decrease is sustained throughout six month follow up to approximately four times um, in the previous 30. That four times encompasses people who um, are not at all successful in the treatment, as well as those that report no meth use in the previous 30 days. Sex while high, again, immediately decreases and stays through follow up. Unprotective insert of anal intercourse, approximately 6.39 partners in the previous 30 days. As soon as you take methamphetamine out of the picture, high risk sex decreases and stays down. And you know, that's why you know, a lot of my work is all about uh, methamphetamine abuse treatment as a form of HIV prevention, because when you treat the methamphetamine, you're treating the high risk sex. Uh, receptive anal sex, we see the exact same. Um, it goes down immediately as people enter treatment at the first follow-up, and it is sustained through long-term follow-up at six months. So in conclusion, um, significant reductions in both methamphetamine use and sexual risk behavior. The long-term follow-up outcomes also demonstrate reductions of methamphetamine use and high-risk behaviors. And although we cannot say that there is causality between these data, there's further in evidence that once again, when you reduce methamphetamine, you reduce sexual risk behaviors among this very high risk population. We believe that the policy implications are very strong that methamphetamine abuse treatment should be part of a comprehensive HIV prevention strategy for gay and bisexual men. If you're going to address uh, HIV prevention among gay and bisexual men who are substance users and you're not looking at methamphetamine abuse you're, and you're only focusing on HIV prevention such as distributing condoms in, in, in bars and sex clubs and bathhouses, you're missing the picture here. Uh, we're very happy that this intervention has now been picked up by the Los Angeles County as a service program thereby really moving uh, research into practice and uh, which, you know, we're thrilled about as researchers when we're able to have a successful intervention that then gets picked up as an ongoing service program uh, to be able to provide this to the community. And once again, I, I want to thank um, Dr. Kraft for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Reebok. Again, we would like to extend our sincere appreciation to all the presenters today for their participation and their commitment to this work and to this initiative. Thank you so much. We would now like to open the floor for any additional questions. Rigo, will you please explain the process to pose a question and open the lines? Thank you, Dr. Kraft. And at this time, if you would like to ask an audio question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please record your name clearly when prompted. To withdraw your question, please press star 2. Once again, at this time, if you would like to ask an audio question over the phone, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please record your name clearly when prompted. One moment, please. And at this time, we have one question in the queue, and that comes from Cornelius Gundelli. Your line is open, sir. Okay. Uh, this presentation was uh, very good and an eye-opener for every one of us uh, as providers. We have uh, so many clients coming to us in that situation, but we are unable to provide specific services to them, uh, as been explained uh, in this presentation, because there is lack of funding uh, for these services because when they come to us, not only with substance abuse but with HIV and with other mental uh, uh, health problems. So it's really co complicated and with limited funding, uh, we are unable to provide 
a comprehensive services for these clients. So what is SAMHSA doing uh, for providers uh, in this area so that we may get funding to serve this uh, population? Do any of the speakers want to address that? It seems to me that this would be a question for Dr. Kraft. <laughs> okay, Dr. Kraft. What particular, uh, I, I think what you need to do is you need to go to grants.gov and look at the uh, discretionary grant opportunities that might be available that would fit the framework for serving this population. Okay. And also to keep uh, keep a just because something's not there today, things are updated weekly and monthly. Okay, so just go to the SAMHSA website to see whether there is funding opportunity. You can go to the SAMHSA website. You can also go to the website for all of the uh, operating divisions of HHS, uh, CDC, HRSA. Um, uh, National Institutes of Health, but there's a there's a single site called grants.gov okay. that that has all of the announcements for not just HHS but for other uh, other funding opportunities as well in the government. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. And uh, Dr. Kraft, I'd like to just join in, Keithley. I'd like to just say that SAMHSA has actually been quite useful and helpful uh, to CBOs that are interested in this uh, this type of work through their targeted capacity expansion uh, HIV uh, initiative and so I would like to you know share that with the um, with the participants that the TCE HIV initiative has actually been quite useful to those of us doing this work that particular initiative, yes, is, is one that you should keep uh, uh, a close eye out for future announcements. There is no uh, announcement out at this time, and I could, couldn't give you a particular time frame for the next announcement, but that is a reoccurring announcement that you should keep your eye out for. Thank you. And our next question comes from Ms. Janine Fabrizio. Your line is open. I want to thank everyone for the wonderful information. I have a question. I understand that's being used as a coping mechanism. However, why meth versus alcohol or marijuana? Does it have anything to do with pleasure or prolonged uh, erections? I think there are a couple of different um, ways to answer that particular question. So certainly we know in terms of the physiological properties of methamphetamine as a stimulant. Um, that it does have the ability for some people to enhance sexual pleasure. So that's certainly part of it. Um, another way of addressing the issue is with regard to availability and what is frequently available among certain cultures and subcultures um, is going to vary from place to place, but methamphetamine seems to be particularly prevalent um, in areas where LGBT individuals may congregate. And it's, it Methamphetamine is used as a sex, sex drug among gay and bisexual individuals in communities. Uh, it does enhance performance, but again, it gets back to the escaping into two things at the same time, uh, the substance abuse and, and highly active sex, uh, which is, uh, again, for some gay men, a mark of being gay. Uh, so it is extremely um, it's more pleasurable than just doing alcohol or some other activity with some limited sex. Uh, this is Joanne Keatley. I, I would like to say that actually many trans women use it to enhance their ability to engage in sex work as well. Yes. Um, so, you know, it, when, you're, um, when you're wide awake, you're able to go out on the street at all hours of the night right. and engage in sex work. And this is, this is Kathy Rebat. Um, in one of my studies with um, homeless users, we found that methamphetamine was a very uh, functional drug for the homeless population for not only allowing them to engage in more partners for sex work, as, as Ms. Keaton just referenced, but also to keep them up at night when they're in a dangerous situation. Right. Right. Thank you. And at this time, there are no other questions in the queue.
All right. Well, I would like to I would like to pose a question actually to all of the presenters. Um, as you know, SAMHSA continues to look at the issue of methamphetamine and at the issue of serving LGBT populations. And it would be great if each of the presenters could just speak a little bit about your own work, what your plans are for the future, and any uh, direction you might provide to SAMHSA as we continue to explore, uh, explore this issue and create new programs and services. And we'll start with you, Dr. Cochran. So thanks. Um, so my current work really has to do with identifying the gulf between the services that are out there um, and what people would like to receive in terms of LGBT-specific services. Um, I think SAMHSA has done a lot in terms of um, things such as publishing a provider's guide for working with LGBT individuals. What I would like to see is increased attention to the different um, subpopulations within LGBT. So looking at lesbian individuals, bisexual men, bisexual women, gay men, transgender individuals, and the variability within all of these different groups um, in terms of specific factors that might be particularly helpful for each of these groups. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Thanks. Dr. Hawkins? Yes, I think uh, we're engaged in doing some support groups for uh, those affected by crystal meth as a way to get the crystal meth individuals actually into treatment themselves. It's a different cycle to break when people are still uh, on the positive side, if you will, of crystal meth use. Uh, and we're trying to move that closer to when they would make a decision to get some help. And I think the other side of this, again, is to realize that with alcohol and other substance abuses that many of our treatment groups are designed for, it's the opposite of what they are experiencing with crystal meth, and we have to tailor the programs more to the crystal meth needs. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Ms. Keatley? Um, I think I, I'm just going to uh, agree with the comments that my colleagues made. Okay, Dr. Reebok. Well, we have a continuum of services here uh, reaching the uh, reaching gay, bisexual, uh, MSM, MSMW, and transgender individuals from uh, harm reduction to uh, outpatient treatment. And we're able to meet people wherever they are in their treatments, uh, in their using sites, and pro provide the appropriate modality for them. We're also starting to, to, to um, work with men and transgender women who are substance users um, in a study to provide uh, uh, hepatitis A and B vaccines to stimulant users and look at the knowledge for hepatitis A and B as well as C. Um, and those in the study get the twin vaccine. Um, and what my future plan is, I would, Dr. Kraft and I have discussed this in the past, is I am really would like to seek funding where I can translate the uh, manual that is now designed specifically for gay and bisexual male methamphetamine users to transgender women who use all substances. Tran the, the transgender women that I have uh, worked with over a number of years are much more eclectic in their substance use and um, use all substances as opposed to simply methamphetamine and really feel that it would be a great service to the community to be able to translate this intervention to, um, for use among trans Thank you, Dr. Reebok. Uh, we we appreciate that. And this is going to complete our time here today. We would like to thank all of you who have participated in today's webinar and invite you to take part in the next webinar in this series titled Data and Meth. What do we know about methamphetamine? What are the policy implications? And how can we learn more about the critical population? This webinar will take place on March 16th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Further information on this webinar and upcoming webinars in this series will be emailed out to all participants. If you would like to be included in these communications, please email your information to Sarah Messa at smesa at sai-dc.com. More information regarding this series and upcoming events will be available in the future at www.methpedia.org. Again, thank you for participating in today's webinar, and this completes our call.
Thank you. And at this time, your call has concluded. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you, and have a great day.